and a mother who only cares about one thing, marrying her off along with her sisters, Jane, the sweet one, and Lydia, the wild one. Lizzie keeps a blog with the help of her best friend, Charlotte. Seriously? And then the other character from Pride and Prejudice begins showing up. Mr. Bingley is now a handsome young medical student, and his friend, the insufferable Mr. Darcy. Darcy, thought malfunction. Darcy? Genuine? Darcy didn't appear on camera for the first 60 episodes, but when he finally did, the audience went bananas. Well, this should be good. You're filming. If you've got something to say to me, you say it here and now. Lydia starts her own vlog with her cousin Mary and her cat, Kitty. And hence, it's one of the main women in town, and is nothing but trouble. Lizzie follows a school assignment to a company called Emberly Digital, which just happens to be owned by Darcy, where Darcy's sister Gigi and his friend Fitz keep growing them together. And their feelings start to change. But then Wigan has a sex tape with Lydia, and Darcy and Gigi save the day, and, well, you know how it ends. Altogether, the Lizzie Bennett Diaries filmed over 150 video episodes across five different YouTube channels with over nine and a half hours of video. And the story spread across 35 social media sites that conveyed vital story content and major plot points and created a bond between the characters and the audience that made the Lizzie Bennett Diaries one of the most popular multi-platform shows of all time, amassing over 40 million views on YouTube. The show won awards for interactive excellence, and knocked Colin Firth off as the internet's most popular Darcy, and created a record-breaking Kickstarter campaign. And most importantly, assembled an army of fans who are now clamoring for more interactive multi-platform content. Let's see, I'm in love with you. Are you going to buy for me? Yeah. You actually, I think you can do it yourself, but just slide it. And if you can't, there's a nice young man over there. All right, great. Right. Uh, all right, so um, what you just saw was a two-minute reel of the Elizabeth Bennett Diaries. I'm going to just do a quick intro about it again. Uh, it's a modernized adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. This is a conversion from PowerPoint, so I apologize for the formatting. Uh, <laughs> because I don't know why the word text is there, but that's okay. Uh, it's the modernized adaptation of Pride and Prejudice for the connected generation. And um, what you're about to see, this is a roughly 15 minute presentation that is the presentation I gave to the jury at the Emmys. So this is literally the Emmy winning presentation. So, here we go. And uh, this presentation has never been seen publicly, so you are the first. So, I'm gonna start it off. So, Lizzie Bennett by the numbers, just like the video you just saw, 160 in-world videos across five YouTube channels. We have nine and a half hours of total video content. It is the longest version of Pride and Prejudice in recorded history. We tell our story across 35 social media profiles using platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Pinterest, Lookbook, and many more. We have 750,000 total social media reach. This is all the followers and likes and, and fans all added together. 40 plus billion views across YouTube. We had a Kickstarter, which I'll talk about more, that did $462,000. And our audience, gotta know who we're talking to, 90% females, 10% males, and 70% of the total audience, the total audience, not just the women, 70% females under 25. Again, formatting, whatever. <laughs> All right, so, to walk you through the user experience, now here's some theory for you guys. I know this is a transmedia meetup and a story and content meetup. So, first rule we have, the transmedia is encouraged but not required. If you want to watch Pride and Prejudice as a YouTube series straight through, we do not require you to do any of the interactive content. You can get the entire story just at the top level, which I'll explain more later. But we do encourage you to dive down, to look around, click around, Twitter, Facebook, all these things. And what do you get? You get an interactive experience. You get the chance to interact with iconic characters, talk to them, they may talk back. You get to receive expanded content, explore it, which will reveal plot, character, and or plot. And you can experience different characters' POVs over the course of the one grand narrative. If those of you know Pride and Prejudice, it is a first person story told from Elizabeth's points of view. We give you the option of exploring the story through multiple characters' points of view. And we are selective with our use of platforms. Not everybody has a Facebook account. Not everybody is going to be on Pinterest. So we select our platforms based on the character to make it an authentic experience. All of this serves to enrich and immerse, and we're going to talk about that in a second. And just to clarify again, again, if you don't want to dive down, you can just play this playlist on YouTube, watch seven and a half hours, 100 videos, and you get Pride and Prejudice on YouTube. <laughs> Next. Basic thing, we, all of our platforms uh, are in character, as I explained before. 
Uh, these are the four basic ones for the main character, Elizabeth Bennett. These are social media metric numbers that are probably up to date within the last 30 days. Again, this is a fictional character. This is not some bloated number. These are actually authentic numbers. YouTube, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, this is basically the, the entry points of where you can come into the story, whether it be from video or through the social. You can talk to her directly and she can talk back. Going a little, diving a little deeper now, social metrics across other characters. This is not all the characters, just some of the key ones here. Lizzie at the top, as you see again, the same numbers from the previous slide. Second one, Lydia Bennett, the younger sister. Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. Jane Bennett, the older sister. Again, different, different accounts here, you see, different accounts. Pinterest and Lookbook, which are fashion, so I'll talk about more later. Georgiana Darcy, who doesn't appear later. And you can see the numbers across these. these again, these are individual accounts, fictional characters, and you see that some pretty good uh, conversion down to, and consistency across these numbers. And a big thing to note here, the official show's account, when you watch a show on ABC, it's, there's like revenge official. This is our version where we tweet about like our news, like we won the Emmy, right? There are more people following the fictional character, Lizzie, than there are the actual show's account, which I find incredibly fascinating. So, uh, moving on. The basic diving experience. The first thing you do, you go onto YouTube, you watch a video. We all know how we do this, we've all done it. What happens after the video? Well, now, now you have a choice. Right here, we have a post roll, and you have some choices to make here. One, you can go to the next video or the previous video, depending on where you are in the timeline. You can go to an alternate character's video, or next video or previous video, again, depending on where you are in the timeline. Uh, you can check out her social, this character's social media destinations right here. YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. And of course, you can buy merch. Why not? Oh, hold on a second. Uh, so the next slide is to queue it up, because the video automatically plays. As an example of interactivity, so the first thing I'm gonna, it's going to play, it's going to be on the right, this side of the screen, the left, your right, my left. Uh, it's going to demonstrate how we use uh, questions and answers to play a bit, to uh, drive character and plot. Here you go. From Heather Estrit yeah. on Twitter, are there any guys in your life right now? That is a great question, Heather. So, Lizzie. So basically what that means is that what we do is we mine questions from Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr, and Lizzie answers the questions not as the actor, but the character. And so we have to script these out. What these questions do, of course, uh, the, the add character and or plot to enhance the experience. The audience feels like they're part of the show now. And of course we can do this in a, in a simpler way. Face uh, the YouTube comments. Uh, Lizzie posts video herself. We, we've established that she's a vlogger and she posts the videos herself. And so, uh, in this frame, Lydia is high-fiving the screen. Daniel Kidder here, I know you can't, probably can't read it, he says, I high-five the screen. Lydia goes, please don't encourage her. It's hard enough living with her as it is. And again, in, in highlighting the character experience or the relationship between those two characters and so forth. Next, another example of activity, characters on Twitter. Two characters having a conversation on Twitter, two fictional characters. We know this, we've seen it before, and at least one of many of you probably have, but we take it to another level. So on the top, on the left side, left column, there's two, these two characters, Fitz and Gigi. They are having a conversation on Twitter. This fan, the top middle here, Lizzie Marquezzi, calls us out. She goes, I need proof that you two are together in order to do this. So we have this card in our back pocket, the picture of the two actors together at this courtyard, ready for this question. And sure enough, both characters bring her into the conversation through Twitter and bring her into the experience. And you can see our engagement here. Again, fictional characters. And finally, this is one of our grandest experiences, the, what I like to call the radical. So, Lizzie, uh, number one over here, the, the far left here, she talks about a company that she's working at and people want to know more about the company. She goes, go down, click down the link below and you can find out more about the company. Fictional company, of course. Well, here's our bit.ly tracking this click link, this link. 33,544 clicks. Where does it go? This website here, it's a fictional website of a fictional company, it's a real website, of a fictional company. Uh, and on this website, there's a call to action. Collins and Collins seeks on-camera talent. This video is playable, of course, and it's a how-to video, how to troubleshoot your light switch. Very dry. And sure, sure enough, we have fans submitting application videos over here in the, on the right column to submit for this position to be a host uh, of these how-to videos. And what do we do? We hire one of them and put her in one of these videos. And that's connecting the entire experience. Now I'm going to move on to the expanded universe where I talked about uh, to expand the character uh, experience where you can do some exploring here. Jane Bennett in our story is a big fashionista. And so here's where you use two social networks that are unique to her to enhance this experience. On the left, 
Uh, Lookbook, which is a fashion social network, Jane puts together a look, this, 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 this whole look you see here, and puts it on the social network. You see the engagement here, the hypes, which are the likes, the likes on Lookbook. She also tags the brands, Forever 21, so forth. And, you, and this look is something that she actually wore in episode, I believe, 12 of the series. And then on the right, her Pinterest. We all know Pinterest. Uh, she posts looks of herself, of course, you see in the kind of in the corners here, but she also pins things that she enjoys and likes herself. And you can see in Pinterest, there's some engagement here where fans are talking to her and um, wanting to know more about the things she's pinning. And then finally, on the exam, oh, no, not the, not the finally, another example of the Extended Universe. Uh, this is Gigi's This Is My Jam account. This Is My Jam is a music social network basically saying uh, what you're listening to uh, as, as tracks. We use this to inform the audience of what she's feeling through a 10-month campaign, which I'll talk about later, as she gets over a breakup. Uh, these, these tracks are songs that a young, uh, could be female, would be listening to as she, as she recovers from a very big heartbreak. Um, and finally, the cats. Everybody loves cats, the internet loves cats, so we put a cat in here too. So, Kitty Bennett in the story is one of the sisters of Lizzie and Lydia and Jane, but we have too many sisters in our story. Why are there five girls in this, in this world? So we're gonna make Kitty Bennett a literal cat. So Lydia calls out the Twitter account on the video. She then, on her, on her own videos, this, in, this, in the, uh, the spin-off, she films the cat in the video. And of course, you make a cat on Twitter, there it is, 14,971 followers. And all, the cat, all this account does is tweet pictures of itself. These cats here, now just to clarify, this is a fictional cat. It's not even a real cat. Obviously, there's a cat playing this character. But the cat's name is not Kitty. It is a fake cat with 15,000 Twitter followers. I know, crazy. <laughs> all right, so now I'm gonna move on to the multi-platform arc example. How do we use all of these platforms to showcase a storytelling experience? And this is, I'm gonna give you two examples of it. Here's one. Um, episode four, far left here, April 19th. This is a Thursday. Uh, Lizzie and Lydia, there you see in the screenshot, they talk about an upcoming wedding that's gonna happen. On Saturday, April 21st, you see a Twitter conversation happening between Caroline and Darcy, who are at this wedding, tweeting about how terrible of a time they're having at this wedding, and how their companion, Mr. Bing Lee, is falling for, keeps dancing with this one girl. What happens? The next day on Twitter, the, the, Mr. Bing Lee and Jane, the girl he was dancing with, follow each other on Twitter. Big event in the modern, uh, modern dating world, I, I would suppose. Then, the, then on Monday's video, April 23rd, Lizzie now brings Jane into the video and talks about the wedding that's happened over the last couple of days. April 26th, Jane posts on her lookbook what she was wearing on at this wedding. Very trendy look here. And, uh, and the same day, Bingley and Caroline talk about the post that just happened. One full thread over one week. Again, second example of the multi-platform arc told through all, multi -plat all these social media platforms. Uh, January 19th, Q&A episode. Uh, this is a Saturday, I believe. Gigi and Lizzie talk about having lunch and then suggest taking, the, taking a tour of San Francisco. This show, this show was set in Los Angeles, so this is foreign to them, our, our great city here today. Uh, but Gigi lives in San Francisco, and she wants to take Lizzie on a tour of San Francisco and set her up with her brother. Lizzie doesn't know this, but she does. We verify the lunch. Two actors in the same outfits having lunch at a cafe, tweeting. This is from Gigi's Twitter account. The next Monday, Lizzie and Gigi bond more, and uh, they just become closer friends. On Thursday's video, they, they, Gigi opens up about her past, but she verifies with Lizzie that we're going to go on a tour, me, you, and Darcy set up, on a tour of San Francisco that weekend. And what happens? That Saturday, January 26th, a series of photos from San Francisco. This is actually here. We actually shot this here. As you can tell, you're all from the city. You know that that actually is May and Hyde, uh, and with the, with the cable car line, and so forth. So we, we, we actually verified this with a series of, you don't see all the photos here, but there's actually, I think, 10 of these. Uh, around Fishman's Wharf and now, you know, all over the place to verify that she has been touring San Francisco with this group. And of course, you can see the engagement down here, uh, maybe not from the back, but like this particular picture between the, with their, our main couple together, falling in love with quotes, has 600 retweets and 2,000 favorites. And again, this is from Gigi's Twitter account. This is so from a supplemental character's Twitter account getting this level of engagement. And so now, we're gonna talk about some theory here. This is parallel storytelling. This is something that I think is one of the primary slides of this presentation. Again, as I said before, if you want to see Pride and Prejudice on YouTube, you follow this top line 12 month story, Lizzie Bennett's videos, you get Pride and Prejudice on YouTube. But if you want to dive down, you get an enhanced experience. You get to see different points of view. So 
Lydia follows the same timeline, of course, and the first four, four months of the story, one through four, Lizzie and Lydia are together. They're physically living in the same place. There's no reason to split them off. But on month four, they split physically. They are just different. They're living in different places. So I said, what is Lydia doing during this month? I'm gonna show it to you. I'm gonna put her on, a, on her own YouTube channel so you see what's happening during the same month when Lizzie is somewhere else and Lydia is somewhere else, so you can see it. They come back together, split off again, come back together, split off again, come back together. So in this example, you can basically follow the entire 12 month story from Lydia's point of view, something that's never been done before in any adaptation. And in the third level here, George Anna Darcy doesn't appear in the videos until month 10. Right here, all right? And so what do we have? We have 10 months of Twitter content to backdate her story. So if you want to go and see what she was doing for the first 10 months of the story, you may not get video, but you get tweets. You get to see what she's feeling for 10 months before she finally appears. And of course, we spin her off afterward. Um, so how, what does this mean? As an audience member, you have many, many choices. Again, you may just watch that top line and never see the other two, that's okay. But you can go all the way down the top line, come back to Lydia, come all the way down, come back to Gigi and come all the way down. Or like many of our super fans, they just kind of went through all of, all of it in chronological order as it was happening. So you saw three points of view simultaneously. And finally, what does this all do? The immersive experience. These are two actual fans who messaged me and said they thought the show was real. They actually thought the show was real. And they knew what Pride and Prejudice was. So they know the story, but they, the, the experience was so immersive to them, they thought it was real. They were, they were shocked, they were actors. That level. And it, just to clarify, we do not hoax. We do not say it's a, it's a, it's a real experience. We just make it immersive as, as experience. You, put, you click one click, and you can see the credits. It's very easy. But apparently we did a really good job. So, finally, oh, not finally, uh, the business. It's a business, we will, you know, show business, tech and everything that, you know, you have to see the monetization. Lucy Man Diaries has five revenue streams as a web series, as an interactive web series. Five. If any of you and I, anybody in this room were to do a, do a, a feature film tomorrow, a fi how many revenue streams we'd have? We'd have zero until we actually sold it. Lizzie Man Diaries is a web series that has five revenue streams, and here they are. Advertising on YouTube, ad sets. An ad plays on YouTube, we get a cut. Number two, merchandising. We see at the bottom here, poster, teacup, journal. Three, affiliate marketing, integration. What this is, is someone wears a dress, we link to the dress, we get a cut of this dress, um, of the sale. Number four, DVDs, which was this Kickstarter right here. We did a Kickstarter, we didn't know if uh, DVDs would sell for a web series that's available for free online in perpetuity. So we said to the audience, if you want it, we're gonna pre-sell a DVD on a Kickstarter. If you order a thousand DVDs, that would get us $60,000 or so. It would be worth, of us, worth us making this DVD. Well, they blew us out of the water. They, or, they pre-ordered 5,800 DVDs at a $55 clip. Again, for a web series that's available for, for free online and probably forever until YouTube fails, if that ever happens. Anyway, <laughs> finally, a novelization. This is not public information. Well, it's kind of public. But Lizzie Van Dyers has signed a book deal with Simon & Schuster to be a novelization of a web series based on a novel that's coming in 2014. <laughs> Thank you. Finally, finally, this is the last slide. <laughs> the legacy of Lizzie Van Dyers is a scripted narrative and serialized web series profitable within one calendar year. It has been studied, analyzed in lecture halls and classrooms across the world as both an adaptation, a modern adaptation of a classical literature piece, as well as an interactive story um, telling innovation piece, I suppose. And it's been compared in place with some of the great adaptation, adaptations of history. I'm not saying we are, it's just people have compared it. You can make your own opinion. All right. And finally, I believe it is the definitive version of Pride and Prejudice for the connected generation. Connected generation being anyone under, under 25 who doesn't know a world without the internet, who never did. And why, as some proof of that, again, you saw in the video, ABC News does a poll about famous actors behind William Darcy. Our Darcy is winning this poll against Colin Firth from the iconic 1995 ABC miniseries. And that is my presentation. Thank you very much. And that's how we won our Emmy. And it was you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Bernie. That was awesome. You're welcome. Um, so now we have uh, Bayard from Blue Bottle Coffee.
actually not win any yet. <laughs> I'll let Americans say. The other one? Yeah. I could do his again. Yeah. <laughs> I caught I caught one. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Hello, thank you for coming. I'm Bayard. Um, I'm the communications specialist for Blue Bottle Coffee. Um, I perform a lot of tasks for the company. I, I split my job basically between internal and external communications. So internally, I'm, I'm the one handling uh, internal education documents, um, sort of like uh, workshops for people, any job description, anything like that. Uh, we'll focus on the external tonight, and that is kind of more aligned with um, any content on our website, um, any sort of press interactions that happen, um, all the social media, and um, again, sort of like trying to generate a way to, to have a, a cross-platform experience for people when they are you know, converting folks who are just customers, uh, Blue Ball customers, and, and helping them understand you know, in a way that it's not just limited to our coffee, how our values translate over. So, um, my main goal is to just amplify our values. We have three main values that we, uh, after many years, sort of squeezed out of our CEO. Um, we wanted a mission statement, and instead he sort of came back with a, uh, a list of three words, and those are deliciousness, hospitality, and sustainability. Um, but before we get into that, there are some challenges kind of that I'm sure you can all imagine uh, between a, a retail setup uh, where you're actually serving somebody coffee um, and uh, trying to convey the experience of retail through an online sort of experience. Um, one thing about, about experiencing Blue Bottle Coffee online is that you do not, uh, you don't get a headache if you don't experience us online like before 2 p.m which is one of the main things we have going for us uh, in a retail setting. Um, but some of the main challenges of conveying our values online, not just selling coffee, but kind of just um, doing things that we find to be pretty effortless in a cafe setting, um, doing those online can be a little harder, and there are a few main reasons for this, and these are the challenges here. Um, one thing for, for us is that it, it is just easier to leave a website than it is to leave a cafe. Um, if you're in a cafe, you're having an experience, maybe you're with a friend, maybe you're doing some work, um, you, and you have, you have a thing that you're working on, uh, a drink, um, a project, something like that. At a website, at our website specifically, you can go and you can leave, and um, I think our, our bounce rate, we recently had a redesign of our website, but our bounce, our bounce rate went significantly down, but still, you know, we aim for, for a two minute time period of people visiting our website. Um, so that's one thing. Number two, it's like, if you're at a cafe and you're, and you're doing work, um, imagine, like, a, the, the analogy I, I try to use is, if there's a steady stream of cats doing funny things and uh, strange, you know, strange singer-songwriters and just various other, um, bizarre things happening outside, that's what you're up against when you're, when you're trying to sell coffee online, or when you're trying to create an experience online for people. Um, that doesn't always happen outside of a cafe. You don't just get distracted and walk out. It's very easy to do that online. Another thing is that it's harder to display hospitality online. That's one of the cornerstones of what we do. And um, you can't be as intuitive online, especially if you're operating a website. Um, as, as you can be in a, uh, in a retail setting. For example, if a barista gives you a cup of coffee and you try the coffee and you make a strange face, they can easily say, oh, it looks like you're not crazy about that coffee. Why don't we try to remake it for you? Or why don't we try to offer you something else? And it's just sort of a, you know, a snap of the finger and it's, and it's all better. Online, it's very easy for somebody to get something, to have an experience, to say nothing about it, and to never visit you again. And you never know. And I always treat any sort of negative feedback uh, online via any social media account as um, a, you ought to treat it as if it's being magnified by 10. Because I believe every t it's only going to be every 10th person who actually speaks up when they have a negative experience, customer service-wise, online. So you have to really pay attention to those things. Finally, it's tougher to create and foster loyalty when you're online. That's been my experience. Um, 
again, when you're in a retail setting, and the reason I keep coming back to retail is because we started as a retail company. We started at farmer's markets back in 2002. Um, we had one location uh, in 2005, and we only began to expand sort of around 2008. That's when we, we really took off. We moved over to Oakland in 2010, New York in 2010 as well. Um, so we're always coming from a sort of retail-facing mindset. And when you're talking about an, an online experience of a coffee company, um, you don't have certain things on your side that you would when you're a retail company. For example, people tend to get up and um, you know, take a shower, get ready for work, and then on their way to work, they'll come by and they'll visit Blue Bottle or, or they'll visit their favorite cafe. Um, when you're online, it's as though somebody wakes up, does their thing, and then they get onto a street where every single best cafe in the world is just lining them on either side, and they have the choice of you know, uh, what, what they want to experience in a way that you don't necessarily, to an, ex in, to an extent it's relieving, but um, online it's very hard to, to kind of keep people loyal when they have so many options and they can access those options so quickly. And also we have lines. Sorry, I'm sure you've seen that. <laughs> So what we found to be most useful when it comes to um, actually executing your values with your content is um, we first had to ask, we had to ask ourselves who we are. And I mentioned our three words before, deliciousness, hospitality, and sustainability. Um, one crucial thing is uh, we want to make sure that, that our product, every single product that we, that we get, whether it's a particular coffee from a particular uh, origin country, whether it's a piece of merchandise we're working on, whether it's a combination of products that we're selling for the holidays, we want to make sure that those things are reflections of all three values that we hold. And we do our best to ensure that in every way. So take, for example, a cup of coffee, just a regular cup of coffee you're served at a Blue Bottle Cafe. Um, we start by actually visiting the farms, creating relationships with the farmers, uh, and helping them monitor their quality control at the, at the farm level. Um, to ensure deliciousness. Once we get it to our roasting facility, we roast it um, in a way that we want to be sure brings out the most delicious aspects of it. Um, and then finally, we provide training to all of our baristas, extensive 30 hours of training at least to every barista to ensure that when they hand the drink to you, you're going to get um, a sort of a reflection of our, of our goals. Um, the hospitality element is pretty uh, straightforward. We want to hire good people. We want to Always be kind, create a hospitable environment. And finally, the, the sustainability element. You know, when you're done with that cup of coffee, we want to make sure that you're not just throwing it away, you're composting it. And also, this being San Francisco, that's kind of easy and great. I think they'll find you if you don't do that. Um, so that's kind of how we think about any product we put out there. And that goes for content, too. Um, and the final step is you just want to make sure you're executing that in a, in a really sort of consistent way and that every execution, every, every step of the execution process is coming from a place of wanting to transmit those values and those goals. Um, so I'm going I'm to give you just one uh, real quick case study in sort of how we implement these values in, um, in our online presence. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about uh, sort of our more mobile social media uh, strategy when we all sit down. But um, earlier this year, uh, or about one year ago, we had a round of investing in Blue Bottle, and one of those investors was Google Ventures, who are located both in San Francisco and down in, um, in Mountain View. And earlier this year, I think it was February, we, we actually went to Google Ventures, uh, myself and the team of our executive board, and um, we basically determined that our old website, which you're looking at now, was, uh, I want to say sucked, but let me try it. <laughs> uh, it was not... It was perhaps the, the most glaringly uh, non-reflective of our values thing that we had going on, period, end of story. And um, we decided that it was time to, to sort of try to incorporate our values in a more, um, in a clearer way and in a more effective way, in a way that drove sales certainly more, but also in a way that kind of made you feel the, hospi uh, the hospitality that we hope um, people experience when they walk into a bottle retail space, when they walk into a cafe, when a barista um, maybe helps them learn a little bit about the coffee they're being served, or um, you know, they meet up with a friend or something. So you're looking at our old website. Uh, this is actually a funny side note about this, is that we, uh, 
this is a screen capture, I think, from last holiday season, around maybe November or December. Um, we, we debuted a line of uh, smaller lot tin coffees that we sell in those small things. You can see the, the top two there. Um, all iPhone 4 pictures. Thank you very much. And uh, we couldn't, our website was so janky at that point that we could not actually uh, customize the order in which the copies were appearing. So you can see Bella Donovan appears third, and that's the B. Decaf Noir, then D. And, um, so you're wondering, what, what trickery did we employ to uh, have small lots happen above those? And it was, we were actually, we had to hit space, and then small lots. And because it was a space, we were able to sort of prioritize those things up front. So that is just one small glimpse of how uh, primitive our, our previous website was. So at any rate, we, um, we went to Google Ventures, and we worked with them for, for one week to sort of visualize what the new paradigm for our online experience is going to look like as far as our web store the purchasing of coffee online goes. And what we came up with, the central theme that we came up with was like, how do we make it more like experiencing a Google coffee when you walk in? How do we make it friendlier? Uh, ignoring the fact that there's a line sometimes again, yeah, sorry, that's one. Um, how do we make it um, a warm space, an intuitive space, a space that attempts to answer your questions? and does so in a friendly, sort of tongue-in-cheek, but generally just sort of a, a hospitable way. And what we came up with was a, you can see actually the, uh, the menu on the side there that was basically, again, no drop-downs, very non-intuitive, it would take you all over the place, some pages were dead, it was a mess. Um, what we came up with was a total redesign of our site, and this, you're looking at the same page. This page accomplishes the same thing that this guy did. It's the coffee homepage. But what's different about this page is that we replicated the cafe experience in a way such that the site itself is asking you the very question a barista hopefully asks you when you're looking to buy coffee and you're a little confused. And you know that you like something with maybe certain flavor characteristics, uh, chocolatey or fruity or something like that, um, but you don't know where to start. So. The website, like a barista, actually asks you how do you prepare your coffee at home. And it gives you a series of options. And when you click on one of these options, it will actually narrow things down for you and pull away several of the different other options so that um, you have a little bit more uh, a little bit more space to sort of take in all the different coffees and comprehend them. Um, and it, it ended up being a, a big success. Our web store sales went up significantly. There are other parts of the website that we improved upon, but as far as functionality goes and as far as executing our values as a company and um, being retail facing in the way that we want to be retail facing, this was sort of the, um, the, the apex of sort of our efforts. Um, and so I encourage you to, to visit it and let me know what you think. Um, we also have, you can see up top, we have a series of brewing guides, which were very helpful, and um, our other ones were hand-drawn. They were very cute, but they were impossible to read. They were like a small comic book that um, was shrunk, I'd say, 50% of its normal size. So now our brewing guides have large pictures. Um, they're very straightforward, very short, very clear, uh, very interactive. Um, this might be better for actually sitting down with, with Frank and the other folks to talk about, but I want to give you just a quick overview about um, our social media and how we, we try to transmit these same values across different social media. So um, I'm sure, as, as you all know, there are no hard and fast rules for what announcement ought to go where, what announcement ought to be you know, across platforms. But one thing that we found to be most effective when it comes to new products coming out or events that we're putting on or something like that, we tend to use Facebook for announcements. When I say we, I am the communications department at Bluebell, so I tend to use uh, Facebook for announcements. Um, there's, a, there's a good deal of interactivity with Facebook. I find that when it comes to actually carrying on conversations with people, also, I don't know about you guys, personally, when, when a company or a, it takes a lot for me to, to follow a company on Facebook, I have to actually really care about that company. But when I see them blowing up my news feed, especially with promoted posts, but just in general, more than a couple times a day, it's a real turn off for me. So I try to make sure that if nothing else, you know, if there's like a lead graph in journalism, a lead paragraph, Facebook is the one sort of tackling those things. The most crucial news, that's what goes out. When people begin to have questions, they want to have a conversation about 
different things. Um, I find that Twitter is most useful for that. I also will often make large announcements on Twitter. But I find that um, when people want to be more interactive with me and, and when I want to uh, shoot back a response or just share a funny article that I think is pertinent to, if not necessarily Blue Bottle uh, specifically, then to the world of coffee or to one of our partners like Cho Chocolate or something like that, it's very easy to just throw that out on Twitter. People really appreciate it. Often it's funny stuff. I think one of our most successful Twitter posts was uh, I found a picture of like a um, Salvador Dali based cappuccino where somebody had poured a part in it and then tipped it over so the clock was like drooping over the side of them. It went nuts. Also, backtracking a little bit with Facebook, our two most, this was like a real crucial moral kind of feeling I had, but our two most popular Facebook posts to date are. One of Usher at our Tribeca location, snapping an iPhone photo of his mocha. And thank, that's number two, thank God, because number one was um, an equality sign we made out of coffee beans when the Proposition 8 movement came down. And that was, that was an ethical thing, and that was something that we thought about pretty hard, you know, when it comes to taking a side on a political issue when you're a company like that. And we kind of, we had to check ourselves, we had to look at our values. And aside from like the virality of that, that was definitely our most uh, popular Facebook post. We just felt like that's kind of what we're about as well. And so um, that's number one. Number two, I was biting my nails though. I was like, please keep Usher equality, <laughs> human rights. I mean, Usher's awesome, but like. Um, finally, we have a SoundCloud account, and SoundCloud is one of the most thrilling um, sort of accounts for me. My background is in journalism, and. Um, <clears throat> One thing that is really fascinating to me is re kind of digging deep with, uh, with various coffee personalities. But in the specialty coffee world, there is such a diversity of, of people, of characters, of different experiences you can have. And SoundCloud has been a great venue for us to kick off the Blue Bottle podcast, which is a super fun thing that I, tr I try to do um, whenever we have, say, a producer or a, um, a producer in town from, say, a different country, El Salvador or something like that or when we're about to launch a new product and there's an interesting story behind it. It's, um, it's something I use my, my journalistic sense for. I try to find the story and if there's a story there to, um, to bring it out on SoundCloud. And uh, it's, it's definitely, you don't just post SoundCloud and, and somebody clicks on it and you know, it's not like a couple of yucks. It's like there's an investment to, to listening to a podcast, certainly. Um, but if people really want to go deep, they find our SoundCloud uh, page to be really good for that. We have about 20, almost 23,000 Facebook fans. Um, we have uh, 21,000 on Twitter, and I think SoundCloud is very new. Um, I just started that a few months ago. I think we're getting close to five or 10,000 on that. Um, finally, Instagram is not on here, but I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, Instagram videos have become a favorite pastime of mine, um, especially if they involve dogs and peripherally blue bottle coffee. Those tend to be the ones that succeed the most. Um, but Instagram, for me, is kind of a way. Instagram, above all else, for me, is a, a tool to kind of add spice to other um, to other announcements that might be more well suited for Facebook or for um, for Twitter. Instagram is allows me to add a visual element to those things in a way that is engaging and maybe sometimes funny. Um, and additionally, Instagram is a great a great way to. Twitter has this functionality too, but it's, it's a little bit different because the pictures themselves don't show up immediately when you're looking at it. Instagram is a, you need sort of a provocation to, to get people to click on the, um, the Twitter photo. Instagram is a way for people when they're traveling on Blue Bottle Business, especially to producing countries like Kenya, El Salvador, Guatemala, our green coffee buyer actually right now is in Indonesia, to file these very brief but very beautiful, very sort of lush, engaging dispatches about what he's up to, uh, about what what coffee is like at the farm level, and just in general to enrich people's experience. So that is my. Did I get the end? Should I? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So yeah, you know we're all up. <laughs> Grab a seat. I think the two speakers can be on the center. Uh, there's a bass. Yeah. yeah, you get the one for bass. Uh, the transmedia one?
transmedia one? <coughs> transmedia content? Yeah, so thank you, both of you. I think this is really a, a, a dichotomy of, of, uh, of brand versus entertainment. It's a really interesting world, and there's a lot of similarities that we're seeing in the way uh, of the approach, but there's also a lot of new things from both sides. Um, I myself have watched a lot of Lizzie Bennett and drink a lot of blue bottles, so I think I'm in a good, uh, in a good place in the middle. <laughs> so uh, please tweet. Uh, tweet us, we've got all everybody's uh, Twitter handles, um, and I think we can start. Frank, you want to go first? So, Myers, I want to start with you. I, mean, I think one of, the things that, I mean, one of the things I'm kind of really excited about in kind of this um, kind of gathering is, you know, Bernie, I mean, what you've done is you've really thought kind of broadly about his story across his platforms and really kind of built that out in this extraordinary way. And, and I think you've kind of mentioned you know, a viewer can go down the rabbit hole for the they like. And I think that's something that the brands are doing more and more of. And, I, and, I'm, and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you, um, you know, how you think about that or kind of what you're finding your kind of audiences uh, doing to kind of explore, in a sense, that world through the different channels that you kind of mentioned. You've got SoundCloud, you've got Instagram, um, you know, the dispatches. You know, I, I was kind of reading some of those on Twitter over the weekend. I mean, they're really, they really do kind of tell this great story. And in a sense, every, 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 every vendor, every place you guys go, every customer is a potential store. Um, and and you, you're, you're kind of amplifying that to your channel. And I'd just like to hear you talk a little bit about um, just how you think about that. Sure. So um, there, is, there are a couple different ways to think about specialty coffee and to think about telling the story of specialty coffee. One of those is very much facing the sort of uh, the farm level and telling the story of the producers and the story of the sort of globe trotting and, and showing um, sort of the diversity of characters that go into producing a cup of coffee. That is a really compelling and engaging way to tell the story of coffee. But the other way, and the way that actually we pursue, I think, a little bit more ardently, is telling uh, the story at a smaller level. We focus generally on our community of people, um, not necessarily just blue bottle employees, but our community in New York of customers, of customer dogs, of, um, of partners that we have, uh, be it wholesale partners or chefs who have been you know, publicly supportive of us that we've worked with, um, and kind of telling their story in a, as many ways as possible. Um, we think that that cultivates a bit more of the community that we're after. And um, we tend to think of the, the larger picture, though important, um, we don't emphasize that as much. And as far as, as far as telling the story, we try to pursue it in a number of different avenues. We're always after engagement. We're always after um, a way to, to get people into the store, especially if they haven't been there before. But, but primarily it's about education. We want to, you know, there's a, there's a we believe a misconception about specialty coffee, about baristas in general, is that it's, they are exclusivist, you know. Um, we, I think, at root, are always trying to foster a sense of in inclusivity and also trying to offer a bit of education about specialty coffee. So that might look like, you know, a dispatch file from Indonesia, but it also might look like um, a public coffee company that we hold, uh, that we announce, you know, via our social media and then document, um, but also hold on a regular basis and. and try to show people that it's not as prohibitive as it may seem, and basically just open it up and be as inclusive as possible on as many channels as, as are possible. And I actually have a question for Bernie, and it, it's really, it's, it's a big question, I think, uh, designing the right uh, content for the right medium. How do you design, uh, in your process, how do you design these different channels when you when you have one character using Twitter and you gotta get interactively interacting with Twitter in a specific way. How do you actually design the right content for the right uh, channel, the right um, message for the right channel? Um, well, as I as alluded to in the presentation, it really comes down to the character. Um, one of the examples we have in narrative is that we look at the characters Lizzie and Jane, who are the two main sisters, the two older sisters, I guess, not only the main ones. Uh, and we say that internally in our team, what like Lizzie expresses herself verbally, and Jane expresses herself visually. And so, just by saying those two phrases, you can kind of see which 
platforms, what one will favor over the other. So if you watch the narrative, you, you follow Jane on Twitter, it's not a lot of content on it. It's just kind of report, reporting her, or repurposing her Facebook, or her lookbook content and her, her Pinterest content. But you look at her Pinterest, it's, it's alive, it's vibrant, it's all this stuff happening. There's plot points and characters, things that are happening on there. And for Lizzie, vice versa. Lizzie is a, is a vocal person, so, so uh, on Facebook, um, She's just kind of reporting stuff, but on Twitter she's very talkative. You know, she chats a lot, she responds to fans, she, uh, more so earlier on than later, but uh, that's kind of how we chose. And there's some touching going on. Yeah. All right. Oh, it's fun here. <laughs> Pretty, it's, it's kind of a fault to that. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that's so interesting about those the virus is how many places it appears. I mean, we've kind of got this incredible map. And I'm, and I'm wondering, you know, kind of where you started, how much of that was mapped, um, and then, you know, how much uh, kind of came together kind of in the process of executing. Um, well, I think, you know, whether it be a brand or um, a story, I think you have to be very fluid. Um, I'm guessing you guys are pretty reactive to a lot of stuff, stuff that happens and you react, right? So for us, you start with the base, you know. For them, I'm guessing it's about coffee, my guess. Yeah. Uh, pretty sure I'm right. <laughs> and for us, it's about Pride and Prejudice. We know that that's happening. So our base was, we're going to tell Pride and Prejudice on YouTube with one character as the, as the main narrator, which is with Bennett. Uh, and that was our mothership. So we start there, we go, we have to do this really, really well. Um, or else the rest of it doesn't matter. The rest of it doesn't matter. After we have that going, we, that's, our kind of, that's our big constraint, which is good, in my opinion. Constraints are good. Um, from there, every, everything's open. It's like, do we want to go down this route? Do we want to do, make a character a LinkedIn account? Does it make sense? Okay, let's give it a shot. Uh, let's see if it's working. You know, there, 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 there are social media accounts that we talked with that, we, that are in our stats that weren't as effective. For example, we used uh, GetFlu at one point. Wasn't that effective. You know, let's say it wasn't that effective. Um, but then we used something like, this is my jam. It became this like, like big thing for this is my jam. They actually use us as one of their examples of how we, uh, how they use their service. So um, it's again being reactive to what's, what's, what's given to you and sticking to your, that mothership content at the end, whether it be about coffee or about pride and prejudice. It both both uh, philosophies apply. Thank you, guys. So, and this is kind of a question for both of you because I think this is sort of the corollary to that, which is, you know, there's there's obviously a voice that you're, you're speaking with, you know, and I think you know that is informed by. Uh, you know, your brand values, you know, the, the hospitality, the um, um, and uh, sustainability. Um, and, you know, you know, Bernie, you've kind of got multiple, well, you've got a kind of a multi-vocal situation going on kind of as the, um, as the show's progress. I'm just kind of curious how you, how you, how, how, kind of what, like what structures do you set up to, to manage and kind of maintain that kind of over time? Um, I have a question for you, so I want to know, <laughs> and you said it. Um, when you talk about the producers that you guys and, and, and the you know the dogs, right, in the community, like the little dogs, right? Um, do you how much do you track them? Like, because that's a narrative. You know, if I want to know more about who's producing this love, this this the, the, these beings, uh, how much narrative is there out there that I can go and find? Um, well, it's not the producers. Dog. I, I okay. It's like the the dogs that belong to us. No, no, of course that. Okay. It's it's like well. I, I, I guess. But how, how much are we tracking? The yeah, how much, you track, how much are you tracking producers? How much are you tracking your, your, your fans with dogs? Um, <laughs> that's a really good question. I am, so I am, um, I'm the only person producing any content for okay. Well Coffee in general. And so what I, what I tend to do is do my best to sort of steal as much content from, you know, from, or opportunities for content from other people as possible. Um, producers are an interesting question because a lot of the infrastructure, um, for, uh, or there's there's not a ton of infrastructure in the places that we're that we're buying coffee from, and so it's not like they're they have the capacity often to be telling their own stories or even providing any sort of context for what we have. Basically, we have the notes that our green coffee buyer takes when he goes there. Um, whenever we can, if we can get a producer there, um, we will take the opportunity to try to tell their story and help them amplify their story. For example, we had a screening of a documentary about one of our um, our producer partners from Guatemala, which we screened uh, a couple weeks ago at one of our locations. Um, another producer who has come and visit 
uh, was the subject of one of the podcasts. And um, I'll be attending the Let's Talk Coffee Conference in El Salvador in about a month. And we're going to be going, myself and our green coffee buyer will be going on um, on a farm trip with one of our, our main producers who we buy from down there. And I look forward to, you know, interviews and photos and things like that. But, you know, basically we take it as we can get it and uh, we try to make the most of what we have. I would agree with that. <laughs> but that's the same strategy. It's, it's, it's the idea of, you know, um, we're, we're both essentially telling a story. It's just, you know, Blue Bottle is as a, as a, as a physical, like, tangible product you're going for, uh, as it was a commodity. But, there, but we're talking about it. Talking about coffee. It's just the bass in my voice, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. We're just going to continue. It's a really exciting panel. Yeah. <laughs> Earth shattering panel. Man, that's crazy. Um, I guess I'm just going to continue because uh, that's going to take care of itself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so the, the, the idea of it's, it's, it's you know, what is out there for you to find? And, and granted, you know, 100% of your audience, of your, of your buyers or drinkers of coffee, aren't going to go and want to look up everything about everybody and what they all the time do. But to those 15 to 25% that do, yeah, they love it. They, they are in, they're going to buy everything up. They're, they're going to go, well, I, I, the story of this producer who makes this coffee I really connect that story. So that coffee is subconsciously better than me. Whether it actually is or not, you don't know. So uh, for us, we do have the same philosophy. Now, you saw, you saw the three timelines that you saw in that, what they said in one slide. Into that top timeline, that's 100%. 100% of the audience of our audience watches that top timeline. 100% of their audience drinks their coffee, right? Now, every level down, they say, we say this in transmedia, I don't know if you guys agree with mine, I mean, you don't have to agree with me, but this is what I believe. Uh, you lose about 50% of your audience. So one level down, 50%. So for us, the Lydia level, 50% of the audience went down. It's actually higher, it's actually 65 or 70, so it's, we have a really good statistic there. But you, have to, you, can, you can basically say, if you're doing a good job up here, you're doing a good job one level down, 50% will come down, and again, if you do a third level, 50% will go down again. 50% of that, 50%, so 25%. So, does it make sense, is why we're here, right, to make content for 25% of your audience? Sure it is. It just, it just can't be the same uh, budget, you know, if you spend 10 million up top, you can't spend 10 million two levels down, you need to kind of figure out the math there and figure out the accounting. But there's value because everybody who's that level down, two levels down, those are your super fans. Those are the ones who buy up everything. You know, they'll buy all the merch, they'll buy all the coffee, they'll buy everything that you sell on your website, because they want it all. They love the brand or the story that much that they'll just eat it all up. And so you have to kind of map out all these things. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's a fluid thing. It's chaotic. I'm guessing pretty chaotic on your side. You have to be reactive to a lot of things. For us, it's also reactive because you don't quite know what the fans are going to say. You know, that example with the photo that the two actors I showed you, we took, I took that photo because I knew I was going to put it in that thread. Luckily, someone beat me, to the, beat me to it and asked about a photo, so I could make this illusion that that photo was actually live and, and part of the universe, rather than something I had queued up as a script. So basically, I was being reactive to, to that. So I was anticipating something, and I got it. Um, I think you guys probably do the same. Yeah. yeah, one thing I think that is really nice is that, um, the content that we're able to produce, we're freed up from being uh, generalists in the way that you often have to be a generalist in a, in a retail setting. You know, we can get a little geekier, we can get a little more into the, um, the nitty gritty, the finer details of the coffee. We can give people brewing parameters, we can talk about like a barista competition or a specialty drink or something that's like very, very specific to the world of specialty coffee and not have to worry about alienating people away from us um, in the way that you know maybe you do if you're in a cafe and there's ton of strange contraptions happening, and not to say we don't have strange contraptions in that way, but um, we also offer, you know, we're always sure to offer a more sort of general approach to, to coffee, just a good coffee or something like that. 
when people come to us, we already know that they're interested in learning more, and we're able to foster that curiosity in ways that are really exciting and like dorky, you know? We really like reaching out over coffee, and a lot of our, the folks who, especially the folks, like you said, who, who actually come to us and follow us are, are interested in that too. So that's, that relieves us in a way. Yeah, I, I'm one of those fans. <laughs> but uh, actually, I wanted to ask you, Bernie. Um, so there is this new role, and it's been developing the past five to seven years as social media has been evolving, and this new form of narrative has been evolving to the next level. So what, and you've been writing a lot of this, what makes a, what's the tools and the ways of approaching, and also what makes a great cross-platform transmedia writer? Oh boy. Um... <laughs> Schizophrenia? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I'll tell you, it, it was, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of jealous uh, of, of you guys. We have one voice, and, and we have 13. So it's like, it's really hard. Um, when we were, when Lizzie Bennett was at its peak, uh, which is basically the beginning of this year, um, there were 13 voices going on at the same time. 13 characters were on Twitter and tweeting. You know, they weren't printing every day, you know, but, but they were, they were, we had to be present of them. We had to be aware that their, their presence is out there in the universe, and they have to be affected or ignorant to certain things in order to keep the narrative intact. So, when you're running a show like that, when you're, when you're, being, when you're telling that narrative, um, it, 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 is, it is very uh, exhausting to, to go like, okay, here's what I know what's happening in the narrative. How does this person react to that? Does it, does it mess it up? She, if, if she does, if he does. Do I need to make, make them ignorant because if they are aware of it, does it make it, does it screw up my, 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 my skeleton and my story? Um, I mean, it is tough. It is tough. I, I tell you, it's like, it's one of those things where uh, I'm finding two types of people in, in Hollywood. Again, I, I, you know, you guys maybe uh, are, are different. Um, but as far as the story <laughs> uh, storytellers go, uh, I find two types. There's the ones who can, type, who can tell that great linear one story. Right? And other types who can do all the transmedia parts, kind of do all these expanded universe things and, and throw, grow out these threats. But to have it all, it's, it's hard. It's really difficult. And, and even though like, I can say that I captain those teams, um, even I need help. Like I go like, when I, you know, I, I, I have meetings all the time and I have to like, kind of put my, my ego aside, my kind of thing, oh, I believe I'm right. But, like, I have to go keep asking my team, am I right? If I'm wrong, you tell me, because I don't want to be wrong. Uh, or I don't want to you know, make a mistake. You know, I'll, ha I'll happily be wrong. I don't want to make a mistake. Uh, and so people will go like, well, if they do this, this character can't react that way. You know, I'm like, okay, great. Okay, and I can get that, get that in my head. But it's a lot of, uh, for us, it's a lot of character psychology. It's a lot of profiling if you want to you know, connect it to something. And so everybody has a profile. And you can go like, okay, extrovert, introvert. Uh, educated, not educated, you know, how do they feel, are they shy, are they outgoing, are they, you know, all these things come into play, and whether all these backgrounds affect how these characters react, and to be aware of all that, it's, it's hard, it's really hard. <laughs> and, any actually suggestions to how to wrap your head around, or another question is, and I think this is something that I always say about Transmedia, have a great team, I think that's kind of almost an answer. Um, yeah, I guess so. I think it's also try to find, identify team members as you form your team. If you're doing it, doing it like our way, uh, you have to kind of assign people voices, you know. Um, for example, uh, Charlotte, the character, best friend character, started, started tumbling about documentary films that she liked. And so the question becomes, all right, who, which documentary films makes, makes her a documentary, you know, like hobbyist, right, or whatever, right? And so, well, I don't watch documentary films. I just don't have the time to do that. Like, is anybody on the team and, you know, writer on the team is like, well, I watch documentary films on Netflix all the time. I'm like, great. Just tumble every documentary film that you watch as you watch it and just kind of tweak it to, to her voice. <laughs> and sure enough, she did. And so whenever Charlotte tweeted or tumbled about documentary films, I had no idea, except for, like, you know, the really popular ones that you'd be watching, what they were. So, like, to, to say, say that I had credit at that part was, no. It was just me kind of handing off those duties to someone else more far more qualified for that area, and the same to the same level, we have the fashion uh, 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 innovation that, uh, that you saw on our side. <laughs> Ironically, uh, a, 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 for a team of seven writers, uh, six more, five of which are women, uh, the, the most the person who has the most fashion knowledge is myself. So um, <laughs> I have I have to be the one to kind of go in there and go like, okay, 
This is Jane Bennett style. Jane Bennett style is a vintage fashion blogger, and this it's not high fashion, it's vintage fashion. So everything has to be built around this same experience. So when the writers were writing about you were writing Jane as a character, they had they really literally could have no input into the fashion because they just were ignorant to that subject. But I I was able to kind of cover most of it, and then I could bring in an expert to verify stuff like, how would she be saying this exactly? And so so it's it's a lot of uh, delegation. Really the key. I think we can open it up. Yeah. Uh, we can start pointing the question. Yeah. 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 You'll hang out and we'll hang out that way. The kind of following up from that last one, I'd be really interested to know what the logistics were um, as far as the, the management of, of the social media accounts. Were there specific writers who were assigned to the characters to take care of those responses or to post the updates? Um, just kind of from a logistical side, how did that work? Um, pretty much, I would say that, I, yeah, you're right. I mean, like, like certain team members had certain characters, but they weren't exclusive um, all the time. There were times where like one writer was writing a Lydia arc for a month, you know, both on the on the YouTube side and on Twitter side, so she would have full control of everything. And pretty much, like, I just had that, you just have to have faith. It's like, you as a storyteller, like, just cannot have that in your brain. It's like. I have, to, I have to micromanage this character as well as all the other threads, forget it. I trust you, go. If you mess up, and eh, we'll learn. <laughs> like, we'll, 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 do, we'll do that next time. And, and, and of course, if you, if you were to go out there and look at every single piece of content we have out there, it's, it would take you days. It would take you days to find it all, but it's all there and it's all, it all adds to the narrative experience. So, but yeah, to answer your question, we did assign stuff. Um, I think, uh, at, at, at some point, I had covered everybody. At some point, but in the beginning, um, my transmedia producer Jay took like the, basically the entire Darcy camp, Darcy, Caroline, and, and Bing Lee, who were who were the opposite of the Lizzie camp, which is the main four girls: Lizzie, Charlotte, Jane, and Lydia, which I took. And then we could kind of like we were we were running two separate lines. We were following one narrative, but we were running two separate points of view. And we just kept that going until we needed to basically hand stuff off to other people. So documenting is an interesting thing. So it, like, obviously the show was, if you can tell, was running in real time across 12 months. And the show is over. Um, how do you experience the show now? now I'm, I'm sure most of you in the room have never seen the show, have never seen the show, and maybe you want to check it out. So if you go to lizziebennett.com today, Lizzie with an IE, there's, there's an archive, there's a, there's a story link which has an archive of every single thing, not everything, but most things, in chronological order. Twitters, Tumblrs, lookbooks, videos, of course. And it's in chronological order. So you could essentially go and just kind of go one click after the next, 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 watch a video, read a tweet conversation, read, uh, watch another video, look at, a, look at a fashion shoot, you know, all the way down the timeline. It'll probably take you, I don't know, 20 hours, I'm guessing, to go through everything. Now, you could also skip stuff. You could say, like, I only want to see the videos. I only want to see the Twitter conversations. You could do that. Now, of course, we live in the world of social media. Social media is terrible at archiving. It's terrible. It's awful. It's awful. So, which is why we don't do very many things on Facebook because it's really hard to thread back. You know, Twitter, it's not easy, but you can use things like Storify, which, which archives stuff pretty well, and, you, and the links are, you know, a tweet is linkable, so you can do that as well. So we do have an archiving system on, on our website. I'm gonna, I'm gonna admit, it's not the cleanest thing in the world, it's the best we got <laughs> until someone develops an app for, to solve this problem. Uh, this question's for Bayou. Uh, you say that you produce content primarily to amplify your values. Um, mainly, I'm talking about deliciousness and hospitality. So I'm curious, especially in a city like this where specialty coffee is as common as it is, which is more difficult to communicate, the quality of your deliciousness or the quality of your hospitality? And how does the content kind of change? Well, I think that... Um I will admit that I can go to any specialty coffee place in San Francisco and be just like thrilled with the yeah. quality of the coffee. Um, I often do. I often go to a place like Psych Glass or Four Barrel or Ritual and just have a delicious cup of coffee. Um, 
we don't generally think of ourselves as competing directly against those folks. We're, part of it is that we're all just sort of friends, but another aspect of it is that um, we view ourselves as more of a community. But that, that being said, I mean, one thing that we try to do to set ourselves apart, I think we, we, we take it as just like a harsh reality because you know, they're just as good at roasting as we are. They're in many cases just as good at, at preparing the coffee. They may take a different approach, you know, it may be roasted lighter or something, depending on people's preferences. So what we can control, sort of at this point, is the hospitality element. So I think to answer your question, we, we emphasize hospitality in a way that, um, I mean, we, we basically go for growth with hospitality. We try to, uh, to do everything in our power to make sure that people are having a, an amazing experience, I guess, both in our cafes but also on our site. And as far as producing content um, online goes, that means, you know, Maintaining that tone of inclusivity. That means fostering engagement with people. Um, that means trying to trying to create shareable content that that helps people align themselves with, with what we're all about, um, and doing that in a way that that just like reflects our values. This is another logistical question, and it's for both of you. Um, I know where you talked about that you're the you're, you're the sole person in your department right now, um, and you talked about the different uh, content streams you're working with. And I wanted to know a little bit more about how frequently you put content on the streams, how frequently you update, what your timelines are, and how you manage that. And then the same for you, Bernie. I wanted to know um, how many, how large was your staff? How large was your budget? How large was your timeline for what you were doing? Which is a very you, you kind of represent the you know the opposite ends of the spectrum here. And I wanted to get a kind of grasp around again how often were people tweeting and you know what was the policy around these things? For me, the, the um, Sorry. there is no set timeline, but um, there are times I think that are that are most appropriate to post on social media. I think before people go to work, right after they're getting off of work, if it is a non-time sensitive. You know, piece of content that we're putting up. Uh, when it comes to something like uh, a, the announcement of the public announcement of a new store opening, which tends to generate the most interest and the most like uh, receptiveness from the people that follow us on social media, that becomes a little bit more orchestrated. Um, I'm in charge of both internal and external, so what I have to do is send an internal announcement out, make sure that everybody has sort of checked back in about it. Um, from there, make the external announcement, but also having um, you know, quoted various press outlets beforehand, uh, and finally, like, launch the public announcement. Ideally, at the exact same time that the, you know, that the press people that I talk to put their stories up, um, I'm able to sort of generate interest between the two, uh, between various uh, press outlets that are covering it. Share that content. Have people retweeting that. Especially recently, we announced um, our first. Not our first lease, but the, uh, a store in LA that will open before the one we signed a lease for, um, kind of farther back, and um, I was able to take different, you know, different routes to promoting that with people that I knew were in LA, people that are fans of ours, and the reception for that was really good. That requires a lot of orchestration because it's sort of like a more sensitive topic. Um, as far as just generating content goes. Um, I try to set a schedule for myself, especially with things on our blog. I have a, a couple weekly blog posts that are, um, we have a something I started on Instagram called the Thursday Throwdown, and that's basically a, um, a competition between all of our locations on Instagram using Instagram video of who can pour the best latte. But not necessarily who can pour the best latte, but who can make the most engaging video with the requirement that there is a latte being poured somewhere in there. Um, and it sometimes includes like fake animal paws and will include people dancing or things like that. And, you know, basically we leave it up to our fan base to vote. And whoever, when I'm going, I, I told them the unofficial rule is when I go to bed on Thursday night and I look, and whoever has the most votes, uh, I've worked out a partnership with a museum here in San Francisco, so they get some free drinks every month, they give us four tickets, whoever wins each week, uh, it's up to the manager to get that ticket out to the person who won the, uh, the contest, and in turn, we have uh, more engagement on our Instagram account. Then I throw that on the blog and write up a little, sometimes fictional, <laughs> backstory about how it came about. Um, so there's that. Another thing is the 
I, I do music journalism in my spare time, so um, I, we have something called the Friday Office Soundtrack, which is just a song, a new song from a new artist that I'll put up every Friday. And um, it's more of a lifestyle thing, it's not necessarily uh, about coffee, because we don't always have any coffee coming out, but it is in line with our values, it, it is in line with sort of our tone, and um, just basically going all out at all times. <laughs> And You're lubricating your channels all the time, it sounds like. Yeah, and definitely, I mean, definitely posting at least one time, ideally twice on Facebook per day, you know, carrying on those conversations on Twitter, um, making sure, I've actually, I, I've opened up the Instagram account to every manager on both East Coast and West Coast, because, let's face it, I'm not in New York, I'm not even in San Francisco when I'm working, I need uh, somebody on the front lines to be sort of helping me generate that content. I, I lean a lot on different people in the company to, to help me out with that because otherwise, you know, all the other responsibilities I have wouldn't get done. Um, and so I, I rely on managers if somebody like Usher, for example, comes in for them to snap a photo. Or, you know, I kind of give them free reign and thus far it's been a really great experience. You know, part of the reason they're managers is because they get who we are, they get what our values are, and they know um, sort of what actions to take and how to reflect those things back and, and make us look good. And I'm really, I'm really thankful to them for that. Do you want to answer yeah. the question? Okay, sure. All right, sure. Uh, quickly, my uh, team, at the beginning, it was three writers, including myself, and one transmitter producer, and I would be I would go in between. Uh, we grew as we went. At the very end, it was seven writers and three transmedia team members, including me. Um, and uh, as far as content, uh, we pretty much had Monday through Friday content, whether it be video, tweets, whatever. Um, there were times where we had content Monday through Sunday. Like, it was crazy and exhausting, and we would all open every day again, but that was, was hard. <laughs> but yeah, the idea was to try to keep content going, because uh, people, people get, you know, you're competing your, for, your, for everybody's eyeballs. And so, just to keep the machine going was really uh, important to us, and so you guys do the same thing. Absolutely, yeah. So um, one thing that actually is launching this month is, again, this sort of falls under the, like, I only have so much time, I need everybody else to do this for me. Um, I had a, on social media, both Twitter and Facebook, I had a, uh, a photo contest for, we have actual, you know, hard copy postcards that um, go into each of our stores, and it's generally a photo of one of the stores with information about buying coffee online or how to find locations through our website on the back. Um, I opened up a competition a couple months ago to actually crowdsource a photo or a design for the next postcard and had a lot of submissions and a lot of very interesting submissions and one good one, which I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and so um, we, we actually did a run of those uh, postcards. They're on our way to my office right now, and so we'll be releasing our next round of postcards. Uh, just kind of, you know, they're free, people grab them, they send them to their friends, whatever. Um, and there's one run of them that has actually our, our photographer that we employ, you know, that we contract out, but also one from this guy, Eric, who had just taken this great high-res photo of Macchiato that he got in, uh, in Manhattan at one of our stores. Um, you know, sent it over, we converted it to the postcard, I asked him what, how long he'd been with us, uh, you know, buying coffee, and what his favorite drink was, and I put both of those on the back, along with his name. And that's, you know, there's going to be a run of 2,000 of those on both East and West Coast. And then we get to, I get to send them some, maybe with a free kind of coffee and give them a shout out on social media. And people like that sort of thing. I also tend to do caption contests if somebody happens to snap a photo of a couple of our baristas, um, like looking quizzically at a drink or something, or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, you know, you can throw up a, a photo on, on Facebook and, and say, like, hey, caption contest, go, free pound of coffee. And the amount of engagement you get is insane. It'll be like two, so I don't know what the exact ratio, it's always been a little unclear what the ratio for Facebook followers to likes or comments on a post is. That means like success, but um, I, can, I can put up a caption contest, and I try to do it once a week or once every other week, and get 500 likes in you know, a matter of a few hours and like 100, you know, 120 comments. And again, like a lot of those captions are just like, no, 
<laughs> but there'll be like three or four, and I'll say, you know, the top three or four, um, like we're going to run with those and we're going to send you a free pound of coffee. And people are so, so happy to get that free pound of coffee with no shipping and anything. And real quick, I will mention too, if you're ever crowdsourcing, this is something I learned when I went to Social Media Week in February in New York last year. If you're ever crowdsourcing, be careful of this particular case. Mountain Dew wants, stop me you know, if you guys have heard this before, Mountain Dew, I think it was in 2011 during the Super Bowl they had, they, were, they had a new like, cherry Mountain Dew that they were going to crowdsource the name for. And so like, like fools, they put the announcement up on their commercials and their social media and they said, the top three names, like, we promise you we're going to pick one of the top three names that America votes for. And it went viral. And America was just like, Mountain Dew Dew. Like, <laughs> Mountain Dew Dew. <laughs> and and like, the top three were just foul. And they were totally uncovered. And Mountain Dew made liars out of themselves. They had to say, like, guys, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the, it can be treacherous, but for the most part, we really enjoy it. Really like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, I'd love, and I'd actually love to see, to hear, besides the very good uh, uh, experience of choosing a member of the audience to be in, in the company, do you, have a, do you have any not very good uh, experiences of that, or um, some juicy stories that the, we could, you could share? I, I mean, not really. It's, it's, no, because, because we, we, we really crowdsourced two things. One was that one example, and the other was the Q question and answers video. So people ask questions, and if they, if they ask a question that I don't want to answer, I don't answer it. I don't write that script. <laughs> so, or if I write the script and it's not very good, you know, Ashley the actor could be like, "This isn't very interesting." I'm like, "All right, we cut it. Don't answer the question." So, um, but uh, it, it, it does, you know, when, when, I think it's different when you say we're going to crowdsource for you know contests and all that stuff, which is, which is great. I'm not not going to say it's a bad thing, but there's also that whole thing of like being a part of it, like you said, like not not, you know. Fallowy, but choosing the brand name type thing, feeling that you love the brand so much that you want to contribute, like that artist did for your postcard, that's like that's the ultimate level for that fan. And so for us, when there was two levels of the fan questions, for example, for the Q and A's. One was like, hey Lizzie, what's your favorite color? She answered it, right? So that's basic, okay? But then like you saw on the video, the idea of this the answer question to Lizzie, and I use that question to bring in plot, where I bring in a character and they have them get, have a conversation. Like, because of that one question. That was like the holy grail for each of the fans. So when the, when, when the fans started asking questions, the biggest thrill wasn't just being having a question answered, it was the, I asked the question that brought Darcy into the video, you know, or I asked the question that did this. So I, th that to me was, as a storyteller, as a guy who was as a storyteller, that to me was the ultimate. I, I was always so proud of, of being able to do that for that fan, just really because he or she, probably she, Ask the right question <laughs> for me. Uh, great. Uh, yeah, I, I was just uh, I was just wondering. Um, I think this is mostly a good, good model question, but, but maybe both of you. Um, so when you're doing all the social media stuff, what mechanisms, if any, do you have for tying? You know, so you can measure engagement and see how many people have responded to stuff. But then, how does that relate to like how much coffee did you sell or something? You know, is there some sort of Tangible end goal. I mean, your end goal is to sell coffee, right? So, or uh, you know, whatever, whatever Lizzie Bennett's end goal was to. to I, I have a good answer for this. Okay. So, so, yeah. You go first. You go first. You're selling coffee. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there are ways to monitor our sales. Yes, and there are sort of loose correlations we can draw between a public announcement or something and um, and a spike in sales. So, for example. Um, if the only way people could have possibly found out about it is through our social media channels, as was the case with our uh, the launch of our new website, when we began to track sales, I mean we had great analytics in place for tracking sales of our website, um, you know, right after the redesign, and so we, we did a little bit of a push and a campaign, and um, we were able to see pretty tangibly and assume at least, or with a certain degree of uh, a certain percentage of certainty that like that bump was caused from social media. And that's great. It gets a little bit muddier when you're talking about a release of a coffee, and we have, say, a campaign that, um, say, I have, a, I have a SoundCloud podcast with the producer because he or she has visited, and I make some, um, I, I have a, either an Instagram photo that week, but also maybe that coffee was new, and people were like, I want to try it. And maybe um, at a certain location, somebody bought it, 
and just loved it and told every single one of their friends. So um, we're still in a little bit of a, a vacuum when it comes to understanding a direct correlation. In some cases, in other cases, again, it's clear. Um, but it's difficult. I mean, there are whole articles that I read pretty religiously whenever they come out of different avenues. Uh, you know, Nielsen is really good for this. Uh, Wildfire, uh, Google's sort of subsidiary social media tracking uh, service has a lot of free papers that they publish that tend to just come out you know, on a monthly basis. A lot of them are about like, ROI stuff with uh, the social media and things like that. But every time I like want an answer, I'm just like, what you know? When I'm selling coffee, if I am selling coffee, and I get one like. How many dollars do I make? It's just, it's not that simple, you know? It's like, uh, it's very flexible in a lot of different ways. Um, so there's still a couple of things here. We asked you a question about what tools we use. We actually use a lot of tools to do a lot of content management on our site. So I'm gonna plug one. It's not Hootsuite. You might think it is, but it's not. Uh, the one we use is called Sprout Social. Um, I think uh, it's just easier. I mean, it's a nice personal thing. And in my opinion, personal opinion, Sprout Social's metric tracking is much stronger than Hootsuite's <laughs> is. Uh, even though pricing wise, it's still more expensive. You know, I, I think the value of the ease of use, I'm an Apple user as well, I value of an ease of use is worth the extra dollars. So um, that's the first thing. As far as tracking direct to something, so there's two, I'll give you two examples of this. One, you know, our product is the content, right? So the more people are watching the videos, the better we are, right? So uh, two examples. Number one, um, before we launched the Georgiana Darcy spin-off channel, uh, we had queued it up with, with suspicious, like kind of suspicious, you know, it was designed to be this way, tweets that this channel may be active. Before this channel launched a single piece of content that had, I think, 15,000 subscribers on YouTube. That's an astounding number for something that has no content, right? <laughs> so, and, 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 and we were able to kind of directly track, you know, how we were sending to it. And then, like, you know, our, our MCN, DECA, was this, was crazy, like, how are you doing this? And it's like, through social. No YouTube at all, just all social. Here's all the trackers, go, go look. So that's the first thing. Second example we have, of course, as I, told, as I said, as one of our um, ways of monetizing, we use affiliate marketing. So the idea of a character wears a dress, you link to that dress, and that link can go to a buy page, right? We, of course, when we do this, we track that link. As you saw, we, as we track that website uh, rabbit hole link. And so we consist, not consistently, depending on the dress, we can send upwards of 15,000 to a dress, and we can sell it out. You know, at, again, depends on the dress. The dress is $250, $300, we're probably not going to sell that one out, right? Because our, our, our audience is 25 and under, they're not rich, usually. Um, but if that dress is $50, uh, that's gone. It's gone within two weeks. So, um, and we can track that. We can just, you know, we can go like, hey, uh, mod cloth, check this out. We just sent 15,000 people to this dress and, we, and, and now because we've locked into affiliate marketing, we can go, oh, we generate this much money for you guys. So, for example, uh, in our, in our spinoff series, Sanitin, Welcome to Sanitin, we did this directly, affiliate marketing to them, and this is a summer series that did one third of the views of this event diaries, and we were generating $6,000 in revenue from, for mod cloth. Like, we were, we were selling $6,000 of clothes for them on a monthly basis, you know? So um, it's just yeah, I mean, and again, all all trackable. Like we, we know this, this this model. It's been around. Affiliate marketing has been around since the dawn of the monetization of the internet. And so uh, we just we just locked into it. That's great. So <laughs> one more question. Who's gonna be? Oh, you can come back. <laughs> and you can talk to him later. So you both had success. Um, uh, Blue Bottle's just been acquired, is that correct? S <laughs> sort of. We had a round of investment. NPR said so. Yeah. yeah. Then it has Talk to be true. to me after. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Too many cameras going on? Too many cameras? Um, and, and you've had success, and you're in LA, correct? Yes. All right, so I've just been back from LA. We will be too. And. Um, <laughs> okay. and uh, <laughs> what sort of prep? Well, I guess I want to ask two things. One is, what sort of pressure are you under to conform to legacy models, or as, uh, as Richard refers to them as paper models? Or um, in TV in LA, what, now you're coming out with a book, and then the next obvious thing is that there's going to be a, a flat TV series. 
uh, that may have a second screen um, component to it. Um, are, you, um, are you under a lot of pressure to conform to existing media models, even though you've both been very successful in uh, <coughs> producing transmedia models? No. Um, well, uh, <laughs> thank goodness. Uh, for, for me, personally, it's uh, social media will always be, uh, and, and content production in general, we love a copy. We're, not, we're in the copy business, and we always will be in the copy and retail business. And that means actually you know, people smiling and holding delicious cups of coffee. And that means like having great experiences in our retail cafes. Um, I don't feel any pressure to conform to, to any sort of traditional marketing campaigns. Um, we, we do have investors, um, but every single one of the investors who's ever come to me to talk about a marketing strategy is just like, never like, market traditionally, like keep doing what you're doing. Um, there's a refreshing degree of mobility to what we do, and it is very low budget. I mean, you know, social media is free, and, and my time is not free, but you know, we're not outsourcing any of that content production to anyone else. Um, depending on how many stores and cities we have in a few years, it might be the case where we need people producing more sort of hyper-local content and developing partnerships in different cities all the time, and that's like the sort of um, the way we might want to grow. But for the most part, right now, um, we're, we're very much embracing the model of you know, not being tied down to any traditional marketing um, mode because uh, we start out risking copying the problem shit, you know, and selling at the farmers markets. And every single time somebody's come along and told us to do something one way, we did the exact opposite, and it's just worked very well for us. <laughs> um, and I can't imagine that you. I mean, the very nature of sort of what you do is not traditional. So I'm very interested to me. Well, I was looking forward to the Super Bowl ad for Ulo. <laughs> 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 Anyway, two years. Uh, two years. Two years, all right. Um, so the pressure to conform to, to traditional media. So first off, um, Lizzie Bennett Diaries has had the discussions of television. I mean, we had preliminary discussions with some of the legacy media studios, many of you know of. There's some cameras on, so I'm not going to name them. Um, but, uh, and they were just curious, really. There was, nothing, there was nothing super serious, but I think it was, it was hard to convey how a vlog becomes a TV series. Maybe it's easier now after the success of the show, but back then, we're talking about a year ago, they didn't know. Honestly, we didn't know. <laughs> you know so uh, it was something that was going to get done. Um, now it's different. And ironically, when you mentioned the book, there's, there, there's a funny thing, is that Hollywood really knows how to turn a book into a TV show. You know, ironically, the show already exists on YouTube, but you know, they, they've done it. Like you know, uh, Pretty Little Liars, Vampire Diaries, Gossip Girl, these are all book series, True Blood. Uh, Game of Thrones, you know, all books that become TV shows. So, uh, my guess is when that book is announced and or published and does pretty well, uh, hopefully, we will have these discussions again. Sure, sure. Now, as far as conforming as, as an artist to the format of, of legacy media, um, sure there's pressure. There's, there's a lot more money, yes, in, in these studios. If I sold a TV show, I would probably you know, I think a, a pilot these days goes for like a minimum sixty thousand dollars. That's just to the writer, you know. So, uh, and they spend four million dollars producing the damn thing. So, there's a lot of money going here. And you know, Elizabeth Diaries did not cost not even a million dollars, not even half a million dollars. The entire thing is less than half a half million dollars. So, there's the there's the fun for you. And another thing too, like we have this pressure. The pressure now is is the, the legacy of Lizzie. That last slide. This great adaptation, uh, innovation. Um, and, and we've, we've put it ourselves to do another Jane Austen adaptation, the Emma adaptation, which launches next Monday. So you can all catch it from the beginning. You can watch it from the start. Um, now, we've had discussions from, again, legacy companies to basically they want to acquire Emma. They, they see it. They see the success of the Diaries. They see the monetization. They see that the, the revenue generated has, has equaled over a million dollars in one calendar year from a startup, pretty much, in revenue. You know, so it, it, it's made you know a couple times over its uh, uh, a couple hundred percent over its over its investment already. So they know there's profit to be made here. So they want it. They want the the TV show of Emma or this of Emma. And I just go, I think it's too early. It's like it's like you having it's you know we're we're in San Francisco. I'd say like it's like having the hot startup the hot startup and selling too early. That's my feeling of it. So I'll take the discussion. I'll have I'll, I'll take the meeting. We'll talk about it. 
But you know, one of the questions they want, and this is this is all media, all visual media, or well, TV media right now, is it's all about territory. So how does a TV show make money? You make a TV show. You launch in the U.S., but only in the U.S., then you, you sell it individually to each territory across the world. UK, Australia, Canada, Asia, Europe, blah, blah. So we, of course, use YouTube, which of course is available across the world, right? So that kind of, you know, chops the, uh, that model in the knees a bit, and we may be throwing away more dollars in, up, up front, but at the same time, we're reaching a wider audience because YouTube is worldwide. Uh, and so our strategy is to go for the worldwide audience rather than try to go for the quick payout and say we're going to we're going to debut on Hulu, which is only U.S. We only watch in the U.S. and then try to sell to each individual territory and so forth. I mean, we may be throwing away millions of dollars to be honest with you. I don't know, you know, because each territory has its own value. And and, and right now, YouTube ads are pretty terrible anywhere that's not the U.S. From my understanding right now. So yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Uh, to talk to them personally, we're um, have a few more announcements before we get up, and then we'll, after that we'll have more pizza and drinks. Uh, Barbara, do you mind coming here for a second? Okay. Do you want to talk about what we have over here? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Okay. I don't have a slide. Hi, I'm uh, hello. I'm Barbara Tien, um, founder of a, a little startup you've never heard of called Ponga. P O N G A. And I've had the privilege of getting to know all of you from time to time at the events I've come to, and Maya and uh, Beth uh, of the Transmedia team. And in, frankly, just enchanted with the whole storytelling, the whole transmedia world. With Ponga, we've created a way to add content directly into an image. So we take a picture, you grab a picture, tag it, in the same way you would Facebook tag who somebody is. But we let you take those tags and put the what, when, why, where, how, all of that content right into the image. And you put as many of those in as you want from your mobile or from the web, and then share it with anyone. The picture that you create is itself a web page, a link that you can share with anybody and post to content. So essentially, social media can now carry that content with you. Ponga is a um, is in beta now in the web version. We'll shortly have the mobile version out as well. And I'm thrilled to just spend time in these transmedia groups because you folks are the storytellers. We just have a tool. And it just uh, gives me tingles to see some of the kinds of things that you guys are already creating and I'm already hearing about talking to you. I'd love to talk to you about it afterwards. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. The event is October 22nd. Uh, it's part of the uh, Futures of the Book uh, week-long conference with Swissnext. We're going to host it at Swissnext. This is the link that's already live. Uh, and actually, I wanted to bring over Manon from Swissnext to talk a little bit about it. This is going to be a really interesting conference. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Manon. I'm from Swissnext. Swissnext is a Swiss initiative. We are the yeah, next of the Swiss Consulate in San Francisco. And we try to connect, well actually we do, we connect the dots between our two countries um, in diverse areas such as um, arts mainly, technology um, and science. And um, we decided to work together as co-organizer of um, futuresofthebook.com which is um, a week about the future of the books in the digital age and one of our events actually is as Maya just said um, a meetup that we're gonna co-organize with uh, Transmedia SF about um, the future of the books and all what it means in this um, digital world and this is gonna kick off actually our exhibition the book lab that's gonna take place from October 22nd to November 1st and <clears throat> part of the weeks, we also have other events organized with the um, Berkeley Center for New Media on the 23rd. Um, it's going to be uh, 23rd and 24th, actually, two days of academic conferences, so feel free to come. And another event we are organizing is um, a day of um, <clears throat> hacking, 
into the, the books and all stories related to the books. It's going to take place at Swiss Next. And we also organized two days conferences um, at the Internet Book Guide. So here it is. Just follow the link and come and join us. Thank you. been our, our partners for a lot of events and we really love having events there. It's such a great space. I actually finished uh, uh, being a part of the jury for a Swiss transmedia competition that they did with, um, with students in Switzerland. It actually were announced this weekend at XPRIZE, which is a big emerging media conference in Switzerland. So really great people. We love working with you guys uh, and excited about uh, our October 22nd event of this whole week. Uh, more, uh, two last amount announcements. We're actually, oh, there's a text over there. <laughs> um, we're actually announcing uh, a new partnership we're having with uh, really great uh, online uh, courses down in LA. RevUp Transmedia and TMSF Transmedia SF are joining to create a couple of new workshops. Uh, the link is already online. Uh, we'll be sending it out as well. Uh, we'll be giving two workshops at the price of one. Online workshops, uh, they're going to be uh, out around November, uh, and it will be Transmedia 101 and an outline of how do you actually create a Transmedia Bible. So uh, look out for these links, uh, they're going to be sent again on all of our social media. Um, and the last thing is, we always need more people. Uh, we do this for you, for us, for this community, and we cannot uh, do this by ourselves. We really, really are so grateful for all of our amazing volunteers that make, make us and help us make this happen every month. Uh, we have two more events, big events coming for this year. The October 22nd and then uh, a November, if I'm not mistaken, 27th is going to be an all around UX. Um, but that's, uh, that's all for this year. But we're already planning the next year uh, of a lot of events coming up and workshops and all kinds of fun things. So thank you again. Thank you, Frank, for co-hosting and co-organizing and for your community that's here as well. Uh, and please enjoy more beers and more pizza and hope to see you here next month.